Hey, it's the Drive School Podcast. I'm Pastor Goodman. Pastor Brademeyer, how's it going? Oh man, you thought last week was nice when we talked? It's even more pleasant today. There's not a cloud in the sky. There's no wind. It's like 60 degrees out. Beautiful spring day. That's perfect. I'm going to open the windows actually as soon as we're done recording because it's nice enough that I am willing to let the sounds of traffic interrupt my day. See, uh, I, I had the same thought. I don't have them open now because there's some elevator stuff happening on the other side of town. It gets kind of loud, but mm. man, my I need to air this place out. It smells like an old church in here. <laughs> I'm going to need you to define elevator because I know what you mean, but most oh. people don't think they make as much noise because they're thinking about going up a story. Yeah, yeah. A grain elevator as in a big old <laughs> building that takes grain in and then loads it into trains and hauls it away. And Oaks is a weird place because we actually have two unit elevators that can load 110 rail cars at a time. And That's so we uh, we move a lot of grain through this town, a whole but, bunch of grain. But does it ding every floor? The that... answer to that is I think they got rid of the dinging somewhere in the 1940s when they got rid of manually operated uh, elevators, right? <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> All right. So whenever we hang out, we ask uh, the questions that the kids are asking us and we pick it apart. So so I got one for you today. Pastor, do you have to believe in creation to be a Christian? You like to give me all the easy questions. This yeah, is a yes suppose, no but... question. And the answer is yes, you do. You have to believe in creation. So so th- let's unpack it just a little bit, though, okay? Because like we, we can go at this from a number of places. First, there are, there are some uh, denominations that would confess the creed but don't believe in a six-day creation, uh, but, but sort of an old earth creation. Uh, the, the Roman Catholics, I, I, I think, are all in on evolution at this point in time, just full stop. Um, they, they say, you know, God drove that boat, but at the same time that, that he did it. Uh, and, you know, even just sort of there, there's that Bible verse that, that says, you know, Paul is saying, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, your faith is in vain. And, and that the one thing that he sort of hooks it to is the resurrection. And we usually sort of grab that as a chance to start to get rid of the things that we don't like in there instead of a chance to actually have some security in the things we're unsure about. So let's maybe let's maybe talk about this a little bit. Okay, so I, I think we need to be fair and in the way that we approach this. And the first thing I think we need to point out is that um, I don't think there is a Christian body out there that doesn't profess something that they call creation, right? Mm. Because philosophically and theologically, there's a big difference between like theistic or guided evolution and, you know, random Darwinian evolution, which I think every Christian would disagree with unless they're really out there, you know? Sure. Um, so, I mean, just to lay my cards on the table, I'm, I'm a Lutheran church, Missouri synod pastor. So I do believe in the six day creation. Six, I believe 24 that, hour days. Yep. Six 24 hour days, just like Genesis says. And the reason I believe that is because that's how Jesus talks about it. Right. You know, when he talks about Adam, he talks about him like a historical person and I am not smarter than Jesus. So I'm just going to go with what he says. Right. You know? and, and this is a place where Christ who rose from the dead told me about creation. And, and, and so that that is compelling to me since you have seemed to have the power over life and death and claim to have been there and, well, been the word that was spoken into creation uh, that, that brought about the light. I, I want to hear you out. If, if you die and stop being dead, I'm willing to, to listen to you. And that's important because like as as we sort of have Genesis explained to us in chapters one and two, God doesn't actually provide a lot of evidence for it. He just says like, on the first day I did this. If you're curious, this is what I did on the second day. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he doesn't sort of say, double check my work. The way that he does with the resurrection, where you can say, let's examine the field. There are all the people that, that were alive and saw it. How do, you con- how do you confront the guards who were there? What about the, the stone? How do you deal with martyrdom in the early church? There's a whole bunch of places to challenge the resurrection. But when it comes to creation, it really is just Jesus said it so, and I don't really have my head around it, but. Well, there's, this is a hard thing because, okay, you know, whether you take an old earth or a young earth view, whether you are a creationist or you believe in random evolution that, you know, has no guidance to it. Uh, you know, the point is, is that whenever the world started, whoever you're talking to, it's a long distance removed from where we are now in mm. our own estimation and understanding. And it doesn't matter if it was 6,000 years ago or like several billion years ago. The fact of the matter is no one alive was there to see it or talk about it. Right. And, you know, people aren't Moses did not see creation when he wrote about it in Genesis. It was a long time after the fact, yeah. you know. So um, this is the problem that we're running up against. And then we have all the stuff, you know, in archaeology and in physics and all these sorts of things. And it gets complicated very quickly. And you find you know, on our end, on the creation end, you'll find some stuff that's really helpful and good out there. And you'll find some stuff that's a little bit crackpotty, you know, and it's really hard to wade through that sometimes because you have everything from very nuanced, thoughtful discussion of the scientific evidence all the way to 
absolutely crackpot, like, you know, conspiracy theory, like, you know, green, green men run the government kind of stuff, right? And everything in between. And so this gets really hard to wade through, which is why as a Lutheran, as a, as a, you know, a Christian, I just, I go back to what Jesus said and I go back to how he talks about it. And that's where I start and everything else proceeds out of that. Cause if Jesus is risen from the dead, well, then perhaps he should be listened to. And like you said, you know, that's, that's why we listen to the guy. And so when he tells us that, you know, Jonah was a thing that actually happened in history, we should probably take him seriously. And when he talks about Adam and Eve, like they're real people and not just figures or myths or something, we should probably take him seriously because again, he's God. And so um, I guess I don't know how else you'd talk about it other than starting from that particular disposition or that starting point. Right. And then you get to to, to be a little bit more honest. I, I uh, you, you do, I think, want to believe the words of God to be a follower of, of God. And, and so here, when he says, I created the world saying amen at the end, seems like a reasonable thing, but, but the why actually is, is a helpful thing to us because now creation is, is our gift to hear about, not our, our burden to defend. Um, right. and, and that, that really matters because now when we start to approach it, it, it's not, how can I, I prove an expert wrong who also wasn't there because a lot of this is just, well, uh, God or uh, science, but but both words are sort of quoted back and forth as if just saying that word is enough of an explanation. Just saying the word science doesn't actually explain science. Uh, just pointing that out there. Um, and, and if an expert who defends a book that you probably haven't read as much of as you claim to is, is not a great explanation, I, I could attack some theists, but I could also probably attack a lot of evolutionists who haven't read the book but are just sort of following the experts. But but rather when we start to deal with this, I want to start to approach it and 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 that what if God was just giving us a good gift? And then you when you when you dive into it, it's less a burden to, to sort of explain how, but but simply to, to allow to be. So for example, um, and, and the, the place where we've kind of gotten to talk about this with uh, with the kids is, is uh, when God created the, the trees that were producing fruit, they were one day old. They were, they were, they were fully mature. And mm -hmm. when God created man and woman on, on their very first day old, they were old enough to be married and have babies. When God made things, he was he, he made them mature. And so if God made the trees mature and the people mature, everything else mature, I'm not going to worry about the age of the rocks. I, I'm just not going to lose sleep because it's not my burden to defend, but rather it's, it's my gift to hear about. Well, that's, I think, the important thing. When we confess that the world was created by God, we're confessing a number of things. One is that God gave it to us. I mean, he says that right in Genesis. You know, he tells mm -hmm. Adam and Eve to keep the, till, keep the earth till it, have dominion over it. Do something useful with it because it is yours. I gave it to you. Which then means, you know, that when we process issues, we think about it differently. So the idea that the earth is here for us to steward and care for, it leads to a different way of tackling an issue like, say, pollution, than, you know, climate alarmist craziness, right? Um, so how does a Christian handle issues like that? Well, it's probably bad to, you know, burn tires and dump raw sewage in the ditch. So we probably shouldn't do that. That's a bad job of bad. taking care of things. Don't do that. But on the other hand, we don't have to save Mother Earth or else she's going to unleash her wrath on us or something because, you know, she's dirt right? She's not actually alive in that way. So, you know, it comes to a different place or like the idea that, you know, some people have that we need to give up human life and flourishing in order to protect the environment. There, well, that, That's not something we can do because the earth is here to serve us and not we serve it. And so that's fundamentally opposed to us simply by the fact that we think God made things. And then on top of that too, we can also confess that there's an order and a reason to the universe. There's a purposefulness to it. It has a goal and a function. There's nothing that's really by accident. Yeah, we have sin and it mucks things up quite a bit, but at the end of the day, God made everything and it was good, very good even as he finished up his creation. And so, you know, what does that mean for me? Well, I'm not here by accident. I'm not just a random assemblage of carbon molecules and electrical discharges, right? I'm not just a pile of meat that has an illusion of consciousness. I'm an actual being made here, put here by God. And this informs something of who I am and my place in the universe that can't be taken away or robbed from me, even if I don't want to feel like I belong here or something like that. Well, and more than that, too, you said sin mucks things up. And so there's another really pivotal part of the creation story that... that we're, we're going to actually need if we actually want Jesus dying on the cross to, to mean anything for us, right? Mm -hmm. Well, there is sin in the world, and this also affects things like the universe. You know, this is one of the problems that a lot of people have with the idea of sin, because so often we want sin only to be a moral thing. You mm. know, I did a bad thing, I chose a bad thing, and, and I hurt myself, or maybe I hurt my neighbor, but it's really just this moral, spiritual thing. But the fact of the matter is the scriptures make clear, like the wage of sin is death. The reason stuff dies and decays is because there's sin. 
And when we look at the universe around us, one of the grave errors we make is that we assume everything works the way it does now for all eternity. It always has. Well, that may not necessarily be true. Like I'm, I'm not a physicist. I'm not a chemist. I'm not a, a you know an archaeologist or paleontologist. But I don't know that it's a safe assumption if you're operating from a Christmas, Christian cosmological perspective to uh, say that things before the fall into sin function exactly like they do now. We, we just, you know, it's a different world when there's no sin. You know, we mark time by when things break apart and fall apart. What does time look like when we can't see things fall apart or decay? I mean, it's a completely baffling concept to us. And so here we are mucking through, trying to make guesses about the universe based on the current state of decay and corruption and sin and death. And maybe that's not the best way to understand its origins. It might be a great way to understand how things are now. But it's also going to be a pretty terrible way to understand the point of Christianity too, because if if sin really is just a bad choice and you could just stop making bad choices, Jesus is really just here to tell you to to try harder and, and not to do anything about. It. I'm serious. But but if sin is actually brought about death that needs to be destroyed, then then Jesus, who died on the cross and rose from the dead, didn't just rise from the dead to prove that we should listen to him, but actually rose from the dead as as, as a victory over all the things that were killing us in the first place. A a a, a, a a creationless death and resurrection doesn't really mean that much. It, it really doesn't. Well, the other thing too is if you if you don't have a doctrine of sin that's robust and actually deals with the present age and all of its problems, you end up attributing to the creative act of God. You know, God made mm-hmm. sin in evil, which means at best we got a God that's just messing with us. You know, like like ants in a little an ant, ant farm. Yeah. yeah, or at worst, he's like actually evil and hates us. And uh, that's, that's a strange thing. And then you open yourself up to all kinds of weird understandings of the cross. Like, um, you know, you've probably run into like the feminist critique of the, you know, uh, the, uh, what do you call it? The vicarious satisfaction. The divine you know, child divi- abuse. Yeah, divine child abuse. It's, you get all this weird stuff that people say, but it all comes from this faulty view of what this world is and how it came to be here. It all ties together. Mm-hmm. I mean, granted, Jesus is the foundation of our whole theological enterprise and everything builds on him. But you do something wrong, it affects other parts of the system. They all cohere. They all attach to each other. And so, I, you know, it, it's you have to understand how we came to be here, what went wrong in order to understand then why Christ had to become man and suffer and die for our sins. It's all part of the same ball of wax. Right. So when we, we kind of circle back to it, then like the, the, the simple answer, do you have to believe in, in creation to be a Christian? Well, yeah, but like, let's do it for, for, for because, because Christ is risen from the grave and that you, you have to believe in. Um, and, and he attests to this, but, but also because it, it informs why he needed to die in the first place. Um, and, and again, we, we, we do this not so that we can simply be at odds with a, a scientific community, but rather so that we can confess hope in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Mm-hmm. Well, and just as an aside, since you brought up the science thing, um, I think it's important for us to remember that modern science was more or less invented by Christians or people who were trained by Christians, right? Mm. And it started out as a way for us to understand the mind of our creator, right? It was doxological in the sense that if I look at the universe and I figure out how gravity interact, you know, how various planetary bodies interact and, and can describe that mathematically, well, I'm giving praise to God by doing physics and describing the motion of orbits and things like that. And so it was a way for us to give glory to the God who made this intricate, beautiful universe. Even while it's full of sin, there's still so much beauty and, and you know, order left in it. It's just astounding. And so uh, that's how it started. And uh, the problem is we forgot about God. And now we have science unmoored from, you know, a creator and unmoored from um, ethics. And, well, it's kind of turning into a horror show in certain quarters. And I guess I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> well, so can I pick apart just a little bit this word unmoored? Um, what what does that mean? Like, so so now science, you know, our parents aren't home so we can actually do the stuff that we wanted to. Now we're no longer tethered to, to something backwards and and um, absent and just sort of, you know, shallow minded. Um, what does it mean to be unmoored from God when it comes to doing science? And why is it bad? Well, see, here's the thing, right? So if you are studying the world. Typically, scientists approach studying the world for two reasons. One is to figure out how something works, and the other is because we want to develop some kind of an application out of it in order to produce something useful. Sure. Um, the problem with that is, is as soon as we start talking about application, or even sometimes the methods by which we gather the data, you're bringing into it an ethical discussion. Because there's ways to do it that are bad, and there's ways to do it that are good. So like, for example, a lot of surgical advancements were made in Germany uh, circa 1939 to 1945. If you know anything about world history, there were some problems. 
there were some problems. And a lot of the people that were experimented on were in fact of concentration camp victims. And the number of the things that were tried on them were absolutely horrifically unethical and terrible. And yet we've learned things from that that helped us develop surgical methods that are still in use today in certain places. So, you know, when we unmoor science from technology or from God, I mean, we can develop technology. We can develop things out of it that are useful. But the way that we go about it can be completely dehumanizing and awful, right? So this is what happens because suddenly the question of whether you should do something becomes less important than whether you can do something. Hmm. That's, That's a really interesting way of thinking about it. Um, so I think we answered the question then. Yeah. I hope so. I don't know. I like to talk anyway. (laughs) Let's do it some more next time then. All right. Sounds good. Take care, man.